Hello, everyone, and welcome to the February exclusive feature for supporter and producer tier patrons. This month, I have the distinct pleasure of sitting down with Khalif Adams, the head of Spawn on Me. Now, Khalif has had one heck of a journey over the past several years, going from a podcast that hardly anyone listened to, to being featured on the Video Game Awards with over 80 million viewers. We talk about his focus on people of color and the need for representation in the gaming industry. Of course, we talk about our history with gaming, the old arcade days and differences between culture then and culture now. We talk about all that and more. Let's go ahead and get to it. And I am live with Mr. Khalif Adams himself. How you doing, man? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you know, we've been playing, you know, Twitter tag for a couple of months <laughs> now trying to get this together. And uh, I'm finally, finally here. Uh, and, and thank you so much for having me. It's always it's always awesome to have folks uh, be kind enough to ask me to be on their on their show. So I'm excited to be rocking with you today. Thanks, man. No, pleasure is all mine and, and no problem at all. I know, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, probably better than most uh, the content creation life right now is uh, it's a very, very busy thing um that we all have going on so i just appreciate you taking the time out uh i'm looking forward to chatting with you man um excited so i uh as i always do when i sit down with these conversations i kind of do my research i've been following you for a long time anyway but do some extra research and uh kind of some interesting conversation points i want to have with you today so yeah i, I always like to start with gaming history because I, I always find it fascinating to kind of understand how people develop this passion right because mm. I'm older. That's where season gaming comes from. You know, I've been in games for nearly 40 years now, and they've always been a passion of mine. And I love to hear from people like yourself, what kind of started that passion for you? What initiated it? Uh, oh, you? man. Wow. Uh, so I've been gaming probably around, probably about as long as you have, too. I'm 43 now, so I've been gaming so since I. probably. Yeah, so I've been, I've been gaming <laughs> since I was probably around three. Yeah, like yeah. You know, around that time. Um, so, I, so, you know, so, so I can say things like, you know, a Coleco vision, and you of know, course, what's that? You of know, course. What's that um, so yeah, I started for me like super, super early. You know, my I was raised in the Bronx back in New York, yes, um, during the late 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the late 70s and early, early 80s in New York, wasn't the most happy and safe of times, very uh, different time yeah. rolling around in there. Uh, so my grandma was the person who actually got me into video games because she bought really? me my first system. Uh, which was an Atari 2600. Of course. Uh, and, you know, that was the thing that was not only, you know, just like what's this new thing that is out in the world that all these kids keep talking about from my grandma's perspective. Yeah. But it was also, you know, the older I got was this thing that wound up kind of keeping me safe within the house, right? It was a thing okay. where, you know, instead of going and running out and, go and getting myself in trouble, like this was a space to be able to kind of use technology to kind of keep me in a space to be safe. Um, so yeah, Atari 2600, I'm lucky enough to have had ridiculous kinds of consoles that have, that people don't remember. So I had a Valley Astrocade. Okay. I, had, wow. I, had, I haven't heard that in a long time. Uh-huh. I had a Vectrex. I had a Vectrex. Uh, I'm sad I don't have my Vectrex still. I'm sad my grandma yeah. broke it. She threw right. it out. <laughs> she threw it away. Oh she no. Of, like there's this weird thing of like, you know, if I, like, if she has technology or it was like. An appliance because she she thought it was an appliance at that point. She's like, it's a gaming system, but like I don't know what the hell this is. Um, <laughs> so she like put it out on the curb and like cut all the power cables so like no, no one way. else could use it. And then I remember that because I was like thinking about it now because having friends in the industry who like know what a Vectrix is and yeah. like knows what that system like the reverence for that system uh -huh. is. They were like, she did what? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, man. I don't know what to do, man. Like, I want one now if I can get one, but they're so expensive. They're very um, expensive now. Yeah. And you kind of run up the gamut of, of, of stuff, you know, into NES and then, you know, Genesis and all those other kind of consoles in between. But yeah, that was the beginning, it was way back in the day, like when I was three, playing stuff that, that I had a, 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 a like love for and learning about technology in that way. So it was super cool. That's awesome. Awesome. Um, very similar uh, background then, because, yeah, I uh, started on Atari 2600. Uh, friends had ColecoVision through, you know, all the classics. I had a Vectrex um, and all the way up through, you know, Turbo Graphics. Yeah. I mean, everyone knows the NES and SNES and everything, but all those other systems, 3DOs and yeah. you know, technology advanced. And then I was a Neo Geo collector at one time. Oh. Uh, not when I was a kid, because nobody could afford it. Yeah, know, yeah, 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 yeah. Later on. but um, I still want a Neo Geo. Those things are ridiculously expensive still now, aren't they? Amazing. 
Oh, yeah. ridiculous. I There was one game I have. So I had the – they have U.S. and Japanese versions of their mm -hmm. carts, right? Mm -hmm. And I had the U.S. version of Metal Slug 3 that I Ooh. bought new when I was back in collecting. It's now worth like three or $4,000. One game. Jeez. One game. It's crazy. Jeez. I always wanted the um, the card that you used to take from your system into the arcade. There was oh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never had. That was the one thing I was like, that was the future to me. Was like, <laughs> I can take my save with me in a big fat card. Yeah. Uh, and then take that with me into an arcade and start from where I left off. Like that. Like even that as a as a as a concept is still wild now, right? Like, yeah. Man, it is. good because times. That was one of the great things about Neo Geo, right? Is the hardware was exactly the same. They just had different code names for it. Uh, mm -hmm. but it was the same hardware. So very cool. Um, so then I wanted to ask you this because I've had a lot of conversations with people from, I'll, I'll say, our era now, mm -hmm. um, especially on the East Coast. So I grew up I grew up outside of Philadelphia, yeah. uh, so not too far from you. Um, but the arcade scene, obviously, was a huge influence on my past and many people our ages past. Mm -hmm. Kind of in that same space. Oh, for sure. Like we went, we used to go to uh, the, Pal no, was it the Palisades Mall? It was the Galleria Mall in upstate. Uh, it was like in New Rochelle, I'd say, okay. New Rochelle, New York. Um, and they had like the best arcades. So like my two favorite arcades were that place in the, in the Galleria Mall yeah. because it was like behind a Nathan, it was like like Nathan's hot dog <laughs> was the front of the actual place. Right. And then it had like this weird like alcove where you kind of like go behind it and around a corner. And it's like a full arcade was, was there. Um, but that wasn't like my neighborhood arcade. My neighborhood arcade was a pool hall uh, right okay. down the block from my house called the Q Lounge uh, mm -hmm. back in the Bronx. Uh, and it had like the it was the worst spot because it was just like full of. <laughs> Like folks playing pool at like 10 a.m. in the morning, drinking, smoking, it's smoking, yeah, drinking and smoking, and then it had like a full arcade in the back, um, and and like you can just remember the smell and the sounds of that. It was all wood paneling <laughs> everywhere, uh, and I remember as soon as you walk into the spot, as soon as you walk in and see the first cabinet, and the first cabinet was an MK1 machine. Nice. And and then you turn and then they had uh, they had a running gun machine. They had a two cab running gun machine. Nice. Uh, if you love basketball, mm -hmm. uh, and they had a grid. They had a, a, a midway grid uh, machine. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Uh, the grid, um, and then they had a couple of pinball machines in the back. So they basically had like probably like twenty machines in there. Like okay. it was everybody was super heavy on all the fighting games on the Street Fighters and Mortal Kombat. Sure. And then, um, you know, they had a couple of light gun machines in there, too. So I think they had a Terminator machine in there. And that was like, you know, when you're growing up and you hear all the attract sounds kind of coming through, uh -huh. you know, the space. And then you hear that new one that like got swapped out. <laughs> of you're course. like, what is that? You're like, yeah. what game is that? I don't know what that is. Let's go check it out. It was no such doubt. a good time. Like, I, I, I think the beauty of us playing and, and still, you know, being in the game space at our age is like, you know, uh, people ask me all the time, like, what is, what's the best part of like doing this work? And I was like, I have perspective. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that perspective just changes so much of the way I think about the work I get a chance to do now of like, how do you think about reviews? And how do you think about scores? And how do you think about, you know, the glut of stuff that you get and the complaints that you wind up seeing? And I was like, fam, do you not understand what <laughs> I was playing when I was, when I was your age? How like lucky we was, are right now! Yeah, right. Like we're we're in a we're in the best time. Yep. And, and and people really just don't understand how good we have it now, in comparison to the garbage garbage that we played back in the day. No like, doubt. Like, it's such a different time. It is. It is. Yeah. I, I I explained to my son who has grown up in this age of just endless games now, right? Yeah. Um, and I explained to him like you know I, I would get a game maybe twice a year. Um, and I would mm -hmm. play that game for that entire period. Even if I beat it on the first night, that's the game you had. That's the game you played. You know what I mean? Yep. And that's just how it was. And uh, it was funny that you also mentioned the experience of seeing a new arcade cabinet because that was always like a going back to that. Right. The variety was so uh, small compared to what we have today. It was just oh, like sure. a, you saw a new arcade cabinet. So you mentioned MK1. I still to this day 
can remember going to my local arcade. It was in a mall, you know, how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, walking in, I used to play MK1 with a group there locally all the time and um, tournaments and everything. And I remember walking in and they had MK2, which mm -hmm. back then you didn't even know was coming mm -hmm. because you had no idea it was when it was releasing. It just showed yep. up one day. And I remember walking in and I was like, oh my God, you know, and every day after school, just riding my bike up there. Just great. Like the and and it's also one of those things too of just like it was such a zeitgeist moment, right? Where you know everyone at that moment when they saw that new MK2 machine, they were like, "We don't know what to like. We don't know what to do." Exactly, exactly. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. besides besides everybody putting their quarter up and, and, and of getting, course you know, getting in line, yep. but like there was mystery then, right? Yes. Of like, oh man, like I remember. You know, going with my composition notebook into the <laughs> into the arcade and writing down every fatality and having yep. it on a small crib sheet in my pocket for when I went to the arcade. Yeah, and being like, "Oh man, oh let me remember this NBA Jam code and put it in so I can do this." Like all that stuff was just not available. Until no, you had to figure it out, and you did it as a group, group. right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think exactly. I think that's the point I, I spoke to Cog about over at Iron Lords. We have a lot of conversations yep. about this. And um, we talk about the camaraderie um, of how it felt like a brotherhood, right? Like it, it doesn't – one of the things I really loved back then about that gaming community is because the focus, and I've written about this, was just to your point. You walk in the arcade, there's a new arcade machine, MK2, a game that's drawing huge crowds, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody yeah. cared who was around you. Mm -hmm. everyone was focused on the game and all of you ha both having fun competing and talking mm -hmm. crap of course mm -hmm. um but also figuring out just as you said no one knew anything more than the other everyone was kind of discovering it together and i think that that brought about this sense of camaraderie that uh in a way is lost today in, in a lot of ways you know oh for sure and and the cool and it's so funny because we you know even even the landscape of the gaming community and, and the, the kind of tech community has changed so much in God, yeah. 40 years, 30 years now where yeah. it used to be very much a jocks versus nerds kind of thing right? <laughs> yeah. where oh, all the nerds are going to the arcade to go play this Mortal Kombat thing. Oh, I'm going to, you know, what, what's that? We don't care about that thing. But right. like now, well, even then, the one or two kids who were the bearers and holders of information were the coolest kids in the room, right? <laughs> sure. Like those were the folks that people were like, hey, I saw you just do this thing. How did you do it? Can you yep. teach me? Or do you have the code? Can you, sh literally, do you have the codes, <laughs> you know, to get to this thing? And that is so interesting because a lot of that, a lot of that has changed so much where everything is so open and, and, and available for everyone that they're, you know, it's it's great that there are no more gatekeepers because I don't think that, you know those folks weren't keep, you know gatekeeping information. They were just like I did this thing and here it is. But now everything is available for everyone all yeah. the time, um, so you don't have to think about like where am I going to go get this information. You can just be patient, and someone will find it. You know, yep. in, in two days or so, like you know, games coming out tomorrow, and stuff will be out in a week. You know, yeah, like oh, a million oh. videos on it. Yeah. Right. So it's such an interesting and, and different time. And again, that perspective is really nice to have. Yeah. In fact, the, the funniest thing, the closest I've gotten to it, I don't know about you, but the closest I've gotten to that feeling lately is when I'm reviewing a game well in advance mm -hmm. and I'm DMing some people about, hey, did you get to this part? And like, mm -hmm. what am I supposed to do? Because there, to your point, at pre-embargo, right? There, there's no content. You can't just Google it or YouTube or anything else. And it's, yeah. it reminds me of those days where you just have to figure it out. And it's, it's, yeah. it's kind of neat in that way, to be honest with you. Yeah, I agree. Like, you know, I was trying to finish up Horizon. Uh, and some someone was like, you know, I was trying to get to this pot. And I was like, this doesn't feel like it's doing what I think it's supposed to do. So I bugged one of my friends who, who was re reviewing it. And they were just like, oh, this, this, and this. And I was like, oh like that's a weird like that's weird you know what i mean like oh that why would you do it that way and oh that's the thing that it, that makes no sense but it like it, you know having other people that you can do that with like it it is the blessing and the curse right of when you when you are at a space where you are reviewing stuff ahead of yes. the general public yeah. where you get a chance to not have to worry about a thing being spoiled for you true but you also have to then go through it you know, you know, without having seen anything and not understanding how certain things work and and some of those things, 
So it's kind of nice, but it's also very weirdly lonely in that right in that way. Because you're also not supposed to talk about it with anybody exactly. else in the group, right? Like, yeah. you know, friend friend embargoes are different than kind of the embargoes. <laughs> everybody, everybody kind of is like, hey, did you know what the deal is with that thing? Like, yeah, I'm stuck. Can you fix it? Like, I don't know. So yeah. it, it is nice to be able to have those circles for sure. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. All right. So you're from the Bronx. Yeah. Grew up, grew up in the same era. I've got to ask you the most important question of this entire interview because I need you to settle this for a, a large debate that rages on till the end of time online, which is, is Chicago pizza actually pizza? Ooh. Hmm. I'm putting you on the spot a little bit too. Oh, yeah. man. So <laughs> the answer is no. Uh, Chicago pizza is casserole. Ah, there you uh, go. There it is. is not. It is. It is a bowl of sauce and cheese with bread <laughs> on the bottom. Um, actually, the fun, here's some funny thing. So, like, I like forever in 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 a day, I will stand for New York pizza. I still believe it I'm is the you. best thing on the planet. I'm with still, you. you know, East Coast pizza is just better than everybody else's pizza. <laughs> but I had a. I still have like a weird craving for Chicago pizza right now, which is. <laughs> Because the thing, so like like our the version of Chicago pizza I've always gotten has been Uno's right the chain store the chain one yeah chain restaurant which isn't really even Chicago pizza either um, so I'm like actually like I'm in this moment where you know I'm like all right Khalif let's 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 actually stop BSing about the things that you have your, you know your preferences for and like give people props and flowers when they get their flowers so I need to I need to actually have some real Chicago pizza so that I can actually say I've had it and I can make an, a full judgment uh but it's you know it's like it's like it's like New Yorkers being like oh, we got good we have we have great uh cheesesteaks when folks from Philly are like what are you talking about like yeah you're out of yeah. your mind you're right so it's like you know I went to Gino's and then and then people like I actually was like oh okay yeah, our yeah. cheese eggs at home are garbage. Okay. <laughs> this is awesome. yeah. It's yeah. funny you mentioned Geno's because the debate in Philly, uh, at least for all the years I was there, was always Geno's or Pat's. Yeah, Geno's uh, or Pat's, right? Yeah, and Geno's is the one I always sided with. But, you know, you know those are those yeah. kind of team debates, if you will. Yeah, I haven't had Pat's yet. I still need to go have Pat's. Uh, but that was like a trip that I, man, I haven't been back in the East Coast for a long time too. So it's like, that's one of those things of like, if you, can you, can you get it on the West Coast and it still be good? Like, I don't know. Like, can they ship it? I don't know. But it's a casserole. <laughs> Chicago pizza's casserole. I'm glad, I'm glad we settled that and uh, that'll definitely have to get clipped out, by the way. Just be prepared for that. I'm waiting. I, I know my <laughs> Chicago gave me four years like, oh, better. <laughs> Whatever, dude. You not have real pizzas. You shut up. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's uh, let, let's jump over to Spawn on Me, of course. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it, you know, a lot of content here. And I was kind of going through, again, freshening up my uh, knowledge base. Uh, I was going through your kind of overview of everything that you've accomplished in eight years of content. Uh, obviously, a, a hell of a journey over the past few years for yourself, which is just uh, incredible to witness. So first, I'll just say congrats, because it's it's kind of not uncanny, but it's unusual, right? Um, and it's it's got to be just kind of um, surreal to to be living through something that's kind of exploded so positively for you. It has been a long road. Uh, and it's one of those interesting things where you sit back and you kind of just like take audit of where things have gone and how things have kind of rolled. And we've had multiple iterations of the show at this point mm -hmm. with various hosts and co-hosts and things like that. So it's been... You know, it's you you never think a thing that you started on a whim is gonna be the thing that drives you so much in so many different aspects of your life. Mm -hmm. Um and that that was one of the things that, you know, when we had our anniversary back in January, mm -hmm. uh, that I sat down and thought about because it is one of those things of, you know. You, you know, as a content creator, you're always wondering, does the audience care? You're mm -hmm. always wondering, you know, how do we get bigger? You're always wondering, you know, if the thousands and thousands of hours that you pour into a project is resonating and, and giving people, you know, some some form of entertainment. Right. And, you know, when I'm on my lowest days, it feels like the answer is no. And then when on my highest days, it feels like, you know, everybody loves you. <laughs> uh, and, and it's great, but it is one of those things of like, 
you know, Spawn on Me has been cranking out shows weekly for, you know, almost nine years, right? So it's been a <laughs> long, long journey about how different everything goes. Like, even the shirt that I'm wearing now, like, this is like version one of our shirt, you know? Like, this is like version two of our logo. Like, right. even seeing logo transitions and being like, wow, we were here at this point, and then we mm. got to here, and now we're here. Um it is it is pretty pretty cool to be able to look back and say wow we we had a an impact in some way on a multi billion dollar huge multi global industry yeah um and that's great like that feels that feels humbling um and and feels like we're hopefully or at least i am hopefully trying to be a good steward of the space when i when i put out a show and, and try to be my most honest and authentic self every week so that that part is really really humbling for sure yeah, incredibly well said. I, I think that's what um, kind of attracted me to your content is, is exactly that is, you know, I I preach all the time. I'm sure my listeners get tired of it at some point, but I preach all the time about just the positivity in gaming, kind of what we alluded to at the start, which is mm -hmm. we're living in this era that is just the golden age of get. We've never had it better. Yeah. Um, and we should be not only positive, but championing positive voices. And I think uh, you do that extremely well. And so all the, you know, um deserve it of all the success and um i think that's that's just fantastic so i i did want i did want to ask you um you you mentioned your logos and stuff yeah. um and the you know the the spawn on me fist yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is is so well done um do you do any of the graphics yourself or do you have a a, a single graphic artist you work with or a group or where did the idea for the fist come from because it's just it's one of those things when i look at it um it looks like it would be out of a well-done graphic novel or comic something like that and it's just I, I really just love the design of it so i was curious how you came about that uh that is all from a collaboration with our with our designer uh his name is zach silver uh he's done a lot of work over at reflect design co uh for myself sancho west kind of funny okay um and we sat down you know during a really really fun moment when you know, a lot of conversations around black empowerment were happening in the gaming space, a lot of conversations around Black History Month. And I was like, oh, man, I was like, I've always wanted a, a, a Power Fist logo um, that is representative of the brand. Um, is there a way to mash up our, you know, the words of Spawn on Me with the fist? Um, and and he's just like, he just sees things that I can't see. Like, again, if you've seen the first logo from Spawn on Me, you would know that I am not a graphic designer. <laughs> I did that one. Uh, and did not do this one and did not do that, you know, that one that's in the right. corner. Um, so, so it, it, it was a moment where he, we said, you like, and the thing I love about him, and I think, you know, a, a lot of folks, I would, I would tell you that if you're thinking about getting into any form of entertainment, really sit down. It's, it, it, again, it's not cheap, but it takes, it takes a lot of thought into branding. And branding was a thing, again, I was an IT dude who was sitting at my desk, <laughs> you know, nine years ago, 10 years ago, when all of the video game stuff started for me. And learning just how important branding is for your visual presence online and keeping things consistent while also playing around with ideas. And he was just like very smart from the beginning to not just ask, what do you want it to look like? But what do you want it to feel like? Mm. What's the feeling you want this to evoke when people see it? And those conversations have totally changed the way I think about design in that way and, and how I think about what's attached to our show in, in a lot of different ways. So like our original logo and, and even you know parts of this that are kind of in it mm -hmm. was the idea was, you know, the name of the show comes from Battlefield. The, the like spawn on me, yeah, uh, sure. You know, cart come from 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 Battlefield. So the yeah. idea was of it always being this blip on a radar. Uh, so you always have this like line that is the the line that's kind of hitting the blip whenever you gotcha. go around a circle. Um, and that changed a bit during the you know the rebrand for stuff. But the 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 logo, the fist logo. That was one of those layers of like, oh, I've always wanted a Power Fist logo. How can we incorporate the naming of the show into that thing? 
And every time I see it, I'm just so happy with it because it, you know it's in the Brilliant. studio. It's like on the wall, yeah. you know, like like all that kind of stuff. It's like a part of who I feel like I am when yeah. you know I'm talking about the show proper. So it's, I appreciate you uh, giving some love to it because I, I love it myself. It, yeah, it's 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 always been the most striking one to me mm -hmm. of your branding, and I think your branding is as you well said. It, it's it's noticeable and on brand for lack of a better phrase yeah. uh, that that logo in particular has always stood out to me so i wanted to mention it today when we talked because uh it's just i knew whoever designed it was brilliant because that's it's not easy to envision things like that um, oh not so. even close and it's funny because when i wear a shirt when i wear the shirts with that on it yeah. people do a quick double take because they see the they see the fist they don't see the words initially right. but when they start to dig i'm like oh <laughs> that's cool yeah. uh so was, i was like yes that means we that means we got it right. So it's <laughs> awesome. So uh that that's kind of a good segue because you know you've you've made it a focus with Spawn on Me to kind of high, highlight uh as you say uh people of color yep. and what I would say underrepresented uh voices in the gaming community or gaming space. Yep. Um and you know I've already said that I applaud you for that and I think that that's uh very very necessary. Um and I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit around uh, your thoughts and a couple of angles of that. So the, the first the first kind of thing I want to ask you is, you know, especially given our gaming histories and knowing how the gaming community has evolved and progressed over the last nearly four decades that we've been doing it. Right. Um, how do you think that's coming? Like when you look at the gaming industry today in 2022, mm -hmm. how how do you feel about the kind of uh, progression it's made over the last five, 10, even 20 years? specifically relating to underrepresented voices and and you know a focus on developers and developer talent and uh especially to representation of the characters we see in games um all all very kind of notable topics yeah i think i think we're in a really interesting space now where you know when i was growing up there were very few people who looked like me who were doing anything publicly in terms of video games, right? Yeah. It took me until my late 30s to understand who Jerry Lawson was and what the story of Jerry Lawson meant to the video game industry. If you're not familiar, he, he made the Fairchild uh, cartridges. Uh, there's one behind <laughs> me uh, on, on, the, on the, the table. Uh, and, you know, that was a huge... You know, boon for the gaming industry. If you understand mm -hmm. anything about the, the the way consoles worked and the, the, the ideas around those, the cartridge, the physical cartridge was was like crucial to the growth of the industry, right? And yeah. Black, as a black man who who helped to invent that, the the ideas around what that means for an industry is still kind of in this weird balance where you know the visibility from a content creation perspective is much larger there is still a huge gap between the folks who are making gaming decisions in the back room and boardroom mm -hmm. and the folks who are playing every day so it's a yep. huge disparate number there where it is not you know lots of underrepresented folks making decisions at the highest levels of gaming yeah. We're moving in and inching up into some of those positions of power, but it's still something that is very, very slow, right? It's like it's like if you think about the NFL, right? If you think about how many black coaches or head coaches are in the space yeah. now. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a similar analog to, to what that is, but it's a very – it's even weirder because the tech space is so much more open, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can do so many various things in so many different disciplines and you can be in that space. Um, so it winds up being in, in feeling like – the, the, the needle is moving so incrementally slow mm -hmm. that it may be feeling like it's not moving. Okay. But when you take a step back and you look at the spaces in which, again, perspective is really key of saying when I was growing up, when I watched, you know, any gaming coverage or anything there where there were two people that I would see, it was Will O'Neill who wound up, you know, being um, a host on G4 later. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then um, Angai Kroll, who was there for game trailers with Jeff Keighley often. He would be a guest right. on, on that show often. And those are the two Black folks that I would see within that space. And, of course, you'd see a, 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 a smattering of other folks within the spaces as well. Now I can look at 
you know, G4. I can look at I mean, the new revamp G4. I can look at, yeah. you know, various different gaming um, sites, kind of funny, IGN, all these other folks where you can see, again, a smattering of people of color underrepresented folks, but I still feel like there is a huge gap between the gaming industry and everything that revolves around it, sales, marketing, um, you know, uh, um, um, representation within games, stories within those games that are representative of real life people and their experiences, and culture, which I think is the driving force behind a lot of what we need to see kind of mash up with entertainment in a way to feel most full and vibrant and actually like representative of a wide swath of people. So I, mm -hmm. I think, you know, when I am in a boardroom and having those conversations, you know, in gaming spaces, that's the thing that I'm glomming on to because, you know, you usually have two arrows in your quiver if you're doing any kind of diversity and inclusion work, which is one, hearts and minds conversations about why this is good for the world. Yep. And then you have two, you have the like, this is good for your bottom line. Right? Yes, it is. Uh, which we've already known to be true because any diversity study around, you know, how, you know, bringing diversity into your, into your workplace is better for everyone and, yep. and makes you more profitable. There's still a huge gap there that we see. Um, and I think, you know, when, you, when you're pulling back and you're like, all right, what's the perspective layer here? We're in a much better position, but we're still moving extremely slow. And I say gaming is a huge reflection of society as a whole. Society as a whole is still moving really slow. And that is only going to be reflected in the entertainment that we get a chance to see and partake in. So I feel like those are the analogs there of saying, like, how fast are we moving as a society to see, you know, uh, uh, you know, changes in institutional racism? How, how fast are we moving to see, you know, acceptance of different lifestyles move in a space? How, how fast are we seeing all of those things work together so that we then have that reflection be, you know, the most quick and kind of intimate version that we see in the games that we get a chance to play. So we're, we're getting there. Um, it's just taking longer than it needs to. Uh, and I feel like that's the, that's where we wind up kind of landing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, um, well, it's, it, it, yeah. So one, uh, completely agree. Uh, it feels like it's uh, incremental and it feels like you're always kind of pushing a, a boulder uphill as they say. Right. Yeah. Um, and it, 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 I think I, Oh, I, I should say, I have to imagine that it probably feels that way because it feels long overdue to begin with. Right. Sure. Yeah. And so, um, the the other thing the other aspect there that you touched on uh, that i think is important is the the despair disparity between you know the focus on um gamers creators everyone we know in the space we know how diverse the players of these games are right i mean yeah. there's plenty of data on it but to your point about the people that are actually uh making the executive level decisions on the well, how these games are made and we don't have to name any of the companies that have are facing you know lawsuits or anything else because sure. of said issues but um you know there's just a huge disparity there and it feels like um feels like again it's just long overdue for for change um so yeah. that was going to kind of be my next question to you really is you know as you speak so much about this and speak with so many great creators from kind of all over um what is the best way you know for our audience who just recognizes this as an issue wants to kind of contribute in some way right what is the best way or are there any kind of resources that you recommend besides the obvious i mean the obvious is mm -hmm. making you know um but anything that you would recommend to these listeners of um you know how you can get involved uh resources sites specific things anything you'd shout out i mean i think any to be fair i think the the easiest way that you can support folks within the space is to support i think i think you know we say that really kind of flippantly it would be like yeah. well to support people but it's you know i think it's going and checking out their work it's sharing stuff that they do like i think right now you know folks over at like paste magazine are doing fantastic work on, on the on the editorial side you know for as much crap as kotaku kotaku gets for some of the stuff that they that they do, which is also kind of weird. like it's a weird double Dutch thing that they do, where it's like yeah. we really like you, but also you're really obstinate and childlike. <laughs> um, but there are some fantastic writers on that site who are putting out great work, right? So I think I think in the media space, it's always about sharing, 
reading, paying attention to, you know, sub subscribing to folks' stuff and amplifying it. I think that's the that's the easiest thing that you can do. It's the most low low hanging fruit that you can can yeah. give. Even if even if it's one of those things of like even if you don't go watch the videos on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the and that helps people grow, right? Sure. Um doing that kind of work is fantastic. Um I also say like the, the the thing you can do with your wallet is extremely important. And understanding that certain games are not going to get made because they're either made by young indie devs who are, you know, doing their first game and potentially not maybe going to make another one is to support the games too. Like we, we want to support the folks who are doing the, 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 the kind of critique uh, layers of what well, you got to support the folks who are making games too. So I'd say, you know, anytime you can go check out something that's like on the, the mix, uh, the media in the exchange, like so many developers are yeah. underrepresented folks within that space. And they usually yeah. do showcases throughout the year. Um, you know, Indiecade, when they were still running around, was doing a bunch of good stuff. I think they're still doing a smattering of things mm -hmm. there. Um, a lot of that work winds up being in the indie space. And I think also just being super vocal about, you know, the folks who are um, doing the work in the creative spaces that are on the streaming side of it, too. Yeah. I think, you know, especially because we're, we're still rounding out Black History Month, uh, there's a, a really great opportunity to go and check out various kinds of streamers and going and checking out folks who are doing that work because it's hard work takes a lot of your time takes a lot of takes a lot of effort to be good at it um and oftentimes twitch isn't really a great space to to kind of do your work there it's you know you have a, a very hostile uh a, a watch a viewer base that as soon as we're on the front page of twitch we get inundated with with terribleness um, and you can help support, you know, folks who are doing that work by going and checking out their work, subscribing, sharing it. And again, it's it's always about, for me, how far and wide are folks who may not necessarily be within those groups sharing the work. And if you can do that part, then you're way ahead of the curve of, of, of finding out, you know, how you can be helpful uh, towards towards kind of making the space better. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. that's fair. That's fair. Um, you know, you mentioned Kotaku there um, yeah. and, and, you know, this this kind of thing they do that uh, many of us joke about. But, you know, I, I obviously run a gaming gaming outlet. It's a very small gaming outlet. Um, but one of the things we talk about internally and the reason I started good in gaming last year was kind of around this, as I, as I said to you earlier, which is there, in my opinion, and I, I kind of get your thoughts, Khalif, on there seems to be a, a lack of uh, at least to some of the major sites uh in my opinion there seems to be a lack of focus on um not only these types of things but just positivity in general sharing mm -hmm. positive communities sharing positive messages uh representing people all of these kind of aspects that go into making us a better community um there's just a lack of it in my opinion in, in the mm -hmm. industry and it, it feels like they should bear some responsibility to do a better job of that um, mm -hmm. And I try to do my small piece that I can with my outlet. Um, but I mean, if if the Kotaku's, the IGN's, you know, all the major players focus more on this, I think we would be in a better place, in my opinion. I know that there are feel good stories within the industry. Like there are triumphs every day that never get. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that's a part of it that is also really frustrating to me, too, where like, again, I, I understand that we are in a multi-billion dollar comp uh, uh, industry that is driven primarily through capitalism which is driven primarily through the want to make money and then that often you know uh, squeezes you know developers and other folks out of a system that they feel like they want to contribute to to bring entertainment to other folks right like i think that's what gaming has always been about has been about trying to find ways to make people happy right um and I think that's the hardest part for me too. And I, and I, and I share that frustration with you as, you know, as a person who sees so many stories every week that are just always about the negativity within the space. Yeah. Again, I think you have to put a spotlight on some stuff because there's a lot of shady business that happens in the industry. God knows I've been, excuse me, in, in many, many back rooms when I've heard some stuff being like, Hey, what's what? That's weird. Like that's, you know, you hear, you hear conversations, you hear rumors, and it was like, Oh my God, that's terrible. Yeah. But there is no counter to that on a large scale right right? right even folks within the industry proper who are some of the largest names in the space don't share positive stories 
And I think that is a thing that is is troublesome because you would swear that everyone in this industry is downtrodden, beat up, and mm -hmm. in you know is, is yeah. grasping for air and asking for help. And there are so many people who you know work every day and make fun stuff and are happy in their jobs. I used to I just left Riot, you know, a couple yeah. weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. And the first thing people ran up into my DMs, they were like, oh my God, are you okay? And I was like, <laughs> I, I mean, and I get it, right? Like there's, there, you, know, there, you know, there are lots of different conversations about, you know, how, how companies have moved in the past, you know, five, six years, right? And I think, you know, right. if you ask certain people, there's only negativity within all of these walls. And I would say every moment that I was there was great. Like mm -hmm. I had, I had a, and I was working in the DNI space in that company, right? Again, no company is perfect, but I think that there is a space to be able to say, it's not always as bad as everyone has said it is. And I think if you say that out loud, the funny thing is the industry is so hell bent on sharing that negative story that your positive story gets drowned out. Of course. That's super interesting. Yeah. So like we just did the Spawnies, which was which was yeah. Congrats by the way. Thank you very much. Yeah. We just did that 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 show. Amazingly positive response. Almost yeah. two hundred forty thousand people watched it. How many stories got written about that? Zero. Yeah. One story got written from a small blog. None of the larger uh, outlets took it and said yeah. anything about it. Not one. And I know all the folks at all these spots, right? right. I was screaming online the week before, like, hey, be done with somebody covered this, right? Yeah. But that didn't get any coverage. And that was a historic moment for gaming, right? So it's an interesting thing of like, again, what winds up getting shared? Who shares it? What's the impetus for sharing a thing? And I think, you know, speaking towards your audience and, and, and other folks in the space, that's a thing that you can ask for too, right? It's like, say, hey, you know, like you, like your outlet is a huge outlet. Your outlet is a is a driving force for traffic and for conversation. Are there any good things happening in the in the industry right now? Can we hear about that? Yeah, because um, that I think is important too. You have to have that balance because otherwise, then what are we doing here? Yeah, what, exactly. what are we doing in this industry? Why are we still doing this work if there's yeah. no positivity in it at all? So yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that for sure. Yeah, no, very good point. And now that you mentioned that, I realized, and now I feel guilty, because we didn't cover the Spawnies. Ah! And, I, and I, I reached out to you on Twitter and congratulated you because I saw the numbers that you guys put up, which were yeah. incredible. Um, and I made sure to congratulate you and say, you know, fantastic. Yet we didn't run an article on it. So now I, I've got to do better. I've got to do shame, better. shame. No, just fine. I mean, again, it's like, <laughs> but you know, like, look, like, and in February, and you know, I understand as well of like, you know, having just like, I didn't go to bed until like 4 a.m. this morning. I'm trying to finish Horizon. <laughs> we're in a very, you know, like, we're in a wild time right now. This it month is, is nuts. Bonkers. Yeah. Bonkers. Uh, this, this month is going to be just like ridiculous for most people in this space. So I, I, and again, like, I think, alongside the conversation around positivity which i think is extremely important also weirdly has been weaponized too yes, with conversations around toxic po positivity which is also a, a thing that i will not get into on this show <laughs> um but i think there is a level there also that i think is missing within the gaming industry which is grace i am not a i am not a religious person i'm, I'm an atheist in, in, in that respect but I think that there is a actual space to give people grace. You miss a story, cool. You you didn't get you you were having a bad day, word. I understand it. You know, you had this moment where you messed up in front of thousands of people. Okay, you get to you get another chance at, at another at another date. Like the industry also doesn't allow people to mess up. Yeah. And yeah. and and in a world where you have more chances to mess up in an open forum than you ever did. Again, sure. perspective, right? I messed yep. up when I was even early days of spawn and be like, no, when nobody was really listening, I could mess up real hard, but nobody heard <laughs> it. You know, like, and, and, and that's the thing is like, I understand that, like, if, if I'm trying to be a good person in the world, the least that I can do is give people space to botch it. And if you botch it, give you space to try to do it again and get better and grow and fi figure out good ways to be 
you know, the person that you hopefully want to be in the space. So I think, you know, all of those layers combined are, it, it makes for the, at least the media side of the gaming industry, this really weird clickish yes. thing that is yeah. unreasonable and probably I would say untenable. I think for me, it's the reason why I've changed a lot of the way I think about my content. Mm -hmm. And I get a lot of, I, I don't get a lot of push and a lot of shares from, folks who are in the industry proper uh who i would hope to share like folks who are in my, who are like media peers to share stuff right because it's 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 too nice or it's too positive or it's too nuanced right yeah of yeah. like oh i i'm not as mad at, at this thing that is your mad <laughs> like i can see i can see the argument and the argument makes nothing but sense but i don't need to reflect that same level of anger right in the same way that you do because I'm just not that mad about that thing. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, like, again, nobody's dying here. Like, yes. We're talking about video games. We're talking about video it's games. It's not that wild. You know, yeah. nobody's going to die unless, unless it's like super, super terrible stuff. But I'm like, you know, we, we have to find ways to fix that. Yeah. Perspective is the right word. Because um, yeah. it is. We're talking about video games. We're talking about uh, escapism, fun. You know, I am, these are things that we... We use for a number of reasons and some people and I, i've written a lot about this not to get us completely sidebarred but sure. you know video games are used in in ways that truly truly help people as well sure. uh sure. you know depression people all of us are human all of us make mistakes we all have certain uh universal things that we need you know and joy and pleasure and love and all these things and it's video games for many of us uh are a part of that equation and uh, to your point, it, it it drives me crazy. The reason I push so hard back against kind of, I guess, what is sadly the norm, yeah. as you were alluding to, is because these, the games being a part of our joy and a part of our happiness and a part of our lives, that's what they need to be. There's, there's really nothing in this space that should cause uh, stress or anxiety or anger or any of those things that we get from so many other places in our lives. That's not what video games are about. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a shame to see. Yeah, I mean, I, I, want, I want people to be, I want there to be, again, a balance there where sure. I want, because again, like that, they're, th those same human emotions are connected to the thing that we find so wonderful about this pastime that we yeah. have. Like there is a human being behind everything that gets made in this space. And I want Correct. people to feel and be their fullest selves, even when they're being crappy, even when they're being, you know, you know, uh, stressed out or, or, you know, damn the man and all the stuff. Like, I think all <laughs> of those things are within that human spectrum of emotion, which I think is really important. I am just hoping that within that spectrum, we, we move the, the needle a little bit more towards a space where we can do the work of being uber critical for things that are bad and for and, and things that are messed up, but also share stories that uplift people and give them hope to be able to say like, this is a thing that I want to do. Yeah. And for me, that's where I'm hoping that we wind up, you know, landing. And, and we're right now we're so, so far to the, everything is bad. Everything is wrong. Everything is, is, is terrible layer of it. That even me as a person who's like a 12 year vet of the, of the industry, I'm like, why do I want to be here if mm. this is the only emotion that we show all the time? Right. Or, like, is that it? Is, is that that's the only thing that we have for the rest of this <laughs> life is that emotion? <laughs> then I don't want to be here if that's the case, because that's not what I need for, for my life to feel like it's doing what it needs to do. And I'm right. hoping that other people feel that way, too, can, and can at least vocalize it. I'm not saying to squash people's voices down. I'm just saying you can at least say it out loud to be like, look, I understand it's messed up, but also is this the only emotion that you feel? Because <laughs> if it is, then you need therapy. Like, go to therapy. Go to yeah, therapy. There, there are better outlets than getting on Twitter about it, for yeah, sure. Yeah, go to therapy. Like, we can crowdfund therapy. I would love to do that. <laughs> Let's crowdfund that. Everybody has a GoFundMe or OnlyFans. I need you to crowdfund some therapy. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Crowdfund <laughs> therapy. I'm putting that as our tagline on Good and I'm Gaming. I'm just saying, man. Like, jeez. I like, know. Gosh. I know. Man. It is. Uh, it can be exhausting, you know, um, oh. especially when you're trying to to enjoy this space day in, day out, and especially enjoy it and cover it. Right. Yeah. Um, you you can't avoid it. And it, yeah. it just like it's it's constantly weaving through all of these obstacles of this um, day in, day out.
It's, yeah. yeah. Um, all right. On to uh, more positive topics. <laughs> I, <laughs> I wanted to um, kind of ask you um, what it was like, because I have to imagine it was, uh, and I used this word once already, but surreal again, being featured at the Video Game Awards um, as part of the future class on video when they have 80 million global viewers. I mean, that that has to feel wild. It, it, it's been a really weird couple of years. So you have the like <laughs> Xbox Paris Lily Kali yeah. thing that then dovetails into the Game Awards Global Gaming Citizen thing and the first yeah. class, future future class thing. Um, it's just humbling again. Like I, you know, I started this thing with with Cicero Holmes, uh, former co-host of the show. Uh, for my kitchen tables in our respective cities of Chicago and Brooklyn. Um, and, you know, I think of, I think of Brooklyn as a city, uh, but, it, but, uh, but it is one of those things where when you think about the potential impact for what you could have done as a person who, you know, from a very young age in school was told that he was not going to amount to anything. Mm and had, you know, my parents are two, two drug addicted parents who I never saw. Mm. I saw them like once or twice in my life. Um, and having my grandma save me and give me video games as a thing to keep me safe. Right. I'm always humble. Like I, I again, I, I think, you know, if the, the tagline for this show is perspective, then I think, you know, I'll double down on it where <laughs> it all comes back to there are so many people every day who are striving to share a message, who are striving to share um, the, the the like ethos of who they are. Like they're constantly talking about in various ways, the North stars that they have built for themselves to think about and to share vocally, visually through their art. Uh, that they want to plant a flag before they are no longer here on this planet. Um, and to be a part of a show that got that many views and is so revered by, by so many folks within the industry, again, is just amazingly humbling. It's just, it just feels good to know that the work is resonating in a way where Jeff Keeley would be like, I want you to be a part of my show. Yeah. Which is a huge thing for him. Like people don't understand that that show is his baby. Yeah. There is nothing that goes into that show that is not approved by Papa Jeff <laughs> in that way. Um, and we've gr we've grown a rapport over the past couple of years. And I think I think he's I think he's actually doesn't get enough credit that, that, that he deserves. And people get into this very interesting layer of, you know, is Jeff doing this for the money or is Jeff doing this? Thing? And I think I think it's a little bit of all of it. Right. Which I think is also smart as a business person, as a person who wants to have like your own legacy to leave for the next generation of the video game industry. Yep. You have to think really big. You have to think about broad strokes. You have to encompass all these different people. Like I have, I have so much more respect for him and what he's been able to do now that I've run my own award show for a year. I can imagine. <laughs> I have, I don't know how he, like, I know some of the layers, but I'm like, I don't know how you do that for six, seven years and continue to try to find ways to make it bigger every year. So like I tip my hat to him all the time when I'm just like, you know, I appreciate the fact that you are doing this thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it's it's just a wild, it's just a wild thing. I was in the room when it happened and I knew it was coming. I was just like sitting there waiting for it to happen because I was like, I don't know if it's going to happen yet. Is it starting? Is it going to do it? Um, and then it did it. And the thing that was the most, the, the memory that I will hold with me forever is throughout the rest of that show, it's an interesting room. Because everybody in the gaming industry, you know, who's a major player is in that room. Right. Um, and for the most part, the, the you know, what folks get a chance to see at home is very, very different than what you get to see in the room. Sure. Because uh, it's a quiet room, weirdly. Mm -hmm. It's it's a little bit too cool for school in a weird way, which I also <laughs> kind of don't like. But the thing that made me, like, lose my mind was, like, when my section came up. Mm -hmm. It was the loudest. It was the loudest ovation that it was in the room That's for awesome. most of that show. Awesome. And to know that that was a thing that happened, you know, because of this work that I get a chance to do, uh, it's just profound. It just it just makes you really happy and proud to be able to say, like, you know, 
even if we never be get you know you never get super big and you never grow to the size you want you had some version of an impact that was lasting uh and that people will hopefully for you know this bubble of time will have remembered it and and, and figured out that it was good so yeah. that part is really really cool that's fantastic man um yeah. that yeah, that had to be uh, uh yeah had to be something um yeah. so uh very well described i uh any any um any kind of funny uh anecdotes from the uh from the game awards that you'd like to share um was there anything that happened this year that was actually pretty pretty wild like this year was actually tame because of covid so it was like you know folks were you know the the rally spot is usually the jw lobby okay uh, you have like a bar right there and it's right ne right next to the microsoft theater excuse me and you know, you go there, go have a couple of drinks to loosen yourself up before the show. Sure. Uh, and usually it's the, it's the funneling of everyone coming in. So, you know, everyone like rolls in. You're like, oh, there goes Jeff Keeley. Oh, there goes Reggie. Oh, there goes Phil Spencer. Oh, it's like this who's who like of the spot. Sure. Like, everyone funnels their way through that spot at some point. Um, and it was it was cool because we hadn't all seen each other for a couple of years. Yeah. Because of COVID just how much we were really happy to see each other as an cool. industry. And that part is the thing that I missed. I remember very, very early in my career, I had a friend of mine who's been, who had been in the industry for a couple of years already at this point. And said, the thing that you'll leave this industry with is the thing, the thing that you should take care of is people and mm -hmm. relationships and friendships that you'll build in this space. And I didn't, and I was like, yeah, whatever. No, you know, you know, <laughs> Because I'm very, I'm very much like to myself. I'm a, I'm an introvert in a lot of different ways, um, and that is so, so true. Mm -hmm. Like we're again when we talk about this golden era of the video game industry, even the folks who are coming up into it now don't have yeah. that thing. Like I grew up with a, a reverence for this industry and the people mm -hmm. in it and the people who are doing that work. And a lot of those folks are either aging out because they're not doing like on screen stuff or they're like moving behind the scenes doing work in that in that space. But seeing so many folks who are still kicking it and <laughs> making good con con uh, contributions to the space that I grew up watching as fans and now with peers that part right. and then being like, oh, my God, Kyle, that was great seeing you at the, in the game awards up on the screen. Blah, blah, blah. And the, like those layers now are the things that I'm like, man, this is this is better than anything that folks could have even told me about when I wanted to, to get into the space of like, what does it mean? Yeah. Um, so those, those layers are, are, are the most fun parts of that stuff. I have more E3 anecdotes, but <laughs> <laughs> my, my favorite one was just watching Shuhei Yoshida coming home one day, going back to, to his hotel. He was drunk off his behind. <laughs> it was the best thing on the planet. It was so oh, great. Man. I love he, you. Shuhei. Shuhei is such a good human being. But it was nice to see him. Just an amazing like, personality. I, we have, I'm dying to have like an actual conversation with him because we've yeah. like, seen him in passing a lot and we've been in the same rooms and I, I took a nice picture with him on the first E3 party that I snuck into. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would love to like sit down and, and have him on the show and like talk to him about like what, is, you know, you've done so much work yeah. in this space and have been a really important ambassador for not only the PlayStation and Sony brand, but like the connection to culture that yep. you know that, that you that you bring for a lot of folks who are very new north american centric and, and having you be that person um in those spaces has always been really really important um so i'd love to talk to shuhei shuhei seems like a really dope cat so I, I he does he does um it's funny the the way you were talking about uh the yep. relationship kind of building and then the people you get to know the friendships and bonds that are created there it almost goes back to a kind of what we were joking about in our in our younger years the arcade conversation that camaraderie that is built it feels like uh you know it's got some semblance of that it feels like once you start to get to know some of these people that you're part of this kind of core group that is a unique group you know any way you look at it it's, it uh, feels like the yeah it feels like the biggest version of the breakfast club <laughs> it, 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 yeah. it is it's like the biggest version of the breakfast club where it's like you know you have various folks who get to come into the you know study hall uh and 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 hang out for a bit and then they leave and they rotate in and out and you know, they change jobs and all that kind of stuff like i've been in the industry long enough now where i've seen people who are younger 
you know, because I've always been old. Like I've always been older in this space. I got into the gaming industry older than most folks did. Um, but like now they're having babies and now they're having families and now they're doing that kind of thing. And it's like, you know, those parts of the industry have changed a lot. But it's it is very much a, like in the same way that people talk about the NBA and the NFL as a fraternity fraternity. Yeah, it it feels like that. Like, I think that they're gaming industry folks who will forever be friends now. And they will, you know, people who I check in on when, you know, they're not doing well or family members aren't doing OK or you just hit them up and it's like. How are you doing? Are you okay? Like, you know, I'm checking in on you kind of stuff where that's very rare for industries. Like I don't do that with any of my old coworkers. <laughs> I'm like, I love y'all. Peace. I'm out. But like <laughs> folks are in this space, but like, you genuinely have a love and appreciation for them because they're going through the same things you're going through in various yeah. different kinds of ways. Um, while also having this huge magnifying glass put on them for the work that they do. Yeah. Um, so you wind up having this just like understanding um, in a different way. It's like we all have the thousand yard stare <laughs> <laughs> in a good and bad way. Yes. Kind of yeah. Two aspects of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, we've kind of covered your your journey to date. And uh, yeah. as you think about this last 18, 24, 36 months, what have you, you know, and the, the kind of escalation there what, what what's next for you man i mean it seems like uh you know not to be uh not to just use a catchphrase here but the the sky's the limit really and uh you know you you've accomplished so much um but i'm sure that uh you know if you're like any of any of us in this space no matter how big or small you always want to accomplish more right it's always what's next what's what are your eyes on so what, what do you think man what do you what do you got planned or what are you hoping to uh kind of get into or achieve over the next, you know, 12 months, 18 months. My eyes are bigger than my stomach. That's the way <laughs> I always think about it. Um, I think that's most of us. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm just like, oh, I want to do that, that, and that. And then I'm like, oh, I don't have funding for that, that, and that. <laughs> uh, so I, I mean it was funny. I was just in a meeting today about the next version of the spawnies, uh, awesome. talking to some folks about what that could potentially look like and how do you expand that. Um I mean I I I, I think of the work that I want to do of like the, the funniest thing or the thing I get kind of the most is like, so colleagues, you made it. So now what? <laughs> and I'm like, I haven't made it yet. Like, I like that's the way I think about it is like, I haven't made it yet. Like, I am not Tim the Tatman. I'm not Courage JD. I'm not, you know, anybody who's like ridiculously wealthy in doing things in the video game space. Again, I don't think that's like the version of making it. But I think that there's a layer there that when you say those names, those names, you automatically know who that is. Right. right? I want to be at that stage. Where gotcha. You're like, Khalif Adams, oh, spawn on me, oh, those things are always connected. Um, so I think from a personal you know, perspective, that's the thing that I'm hoping to do is to get into more and bigger spaces. Because again, I think there is that missing layer of culture and uh, especially black and brown culture that is missing connected to games. And I'm trying to always find find good ways to connect those those things yeah. together um i also want to do stuff that's not gaming related like uh, there's a project that i get a chance to announce in a couple of weeks hopefully cool um that'll be non-gaming stuff but it'll be super fun where i get a chance to host a thing i never got a chance to host before awesome. uh, so i think it's a little bit of that uh it's a little bit of you know how do we change production i think the next thing that i'm trying to figure out is like i've had this dream of what does spawn on me look like in in a in a kind of virtual production way again mm. not nfts and not metaverse <laughs> don't beat me um metaverse maybe because i think metaverse is different than, than nfts and if you actually are paying attention but um you know i'm building out the, the the studio in the other room to to be the counterpart to this one so that's going to be a thing of like how do you make that change like i, I want to mash up and, and and again i think even the gaming industry doesn't, from a production standpoint, play on the bleeding edges of tech. And yeah. I want to do something in that space that'll be fun and weird and funky. And if nobody likes it, I don't care. <laughs> like, I, I think, I think it's, this is like a project for me to see if like, sure. I can. Sure. Um, so like, I think, you know, it's just a hope that I'm still kicking and relevant in the next couple of months. I think the way I, the way when I, the, the real answer to that question is every week, I am on an NBA 10 day contract and that's the way I look at it. 
I'm like, every week I get to re-up on my 10-day 10, uh, contract. Some weeks I start, some weeks I'm on the bench. <laughs> um, but I but I still have a contract every week. And I think getting the chance to think about it that way also gives me good ways to not get big-headed about things when they go really well and tamp myself down a little bit. And also not to get too low when things don't hit, when I have an expectation for them to be really, really great. Hmm. Uh, so it's all about trying to keep myself in even keel space so I can kind of figure out good ways to make good work and hopefully relevant work that, that people really, you know, connect to from an emotional level. Uh, continue to try to figure out good ways to be smart and nuanced about the work that I get a chance to do. And hopefully po- folks will come along for the ride for as long as we're still doing this. So I, I appreciate everybody who's taking time out of their busy, busy days to listen to anything that I've ever put out. And it means a lot. Great perspective, man. That, that's going to be our word of the day, I think, is perspective. Yeah. Um, no, I, pr- I appreciate that. And uh, I think that's a really cool way to look at it, too um especially with what you've accomplished but um there's always ups and downs right uh there's always successes and failures and uh it's cool uh hearing you that hearing you say that you want to experiment and just continue to you know do new things so it's awesome man um so well khalif man it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today honestly uh really enjoyed the conversation love the (laughs) can say the word again love the perspective uh love the thoughts and um just uh, again, uh, just a final shout out to say congrats to you on what you've accomplished. I uh, wish you nothing but the best and uh, success and everything you want to achieve going forward. And uh, I hope that uh, we can catch up again in the future. Maybe we do this, you know, a year from now and uh, we'll see. We'll see what's happened. Anytime you want me back on the show, I am absolutely down. Uh, I love I love what you do here. I love the way you handle conversations and, and, and your interview style. It, it makes me feel very, very much at home. Awesome. Uh, so, so, so that 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 is that is brilliant and fantastic. And hopefully, we can go check out Pats at some point <laughs> together. We'll go take that. We'll take that troop down to Pats and we'll see who wins the actual crown. Yeah, uh, so. yeah. Uh, that that debate will never end. But but <laughs> but we did solve the pizza to debate today. It's oh, over. It's it's done. We've already we've already we, again. <laughs> world, world peace is, is Chicago pizza pizza. Chicago <laughs> pizza is not pizza, but we we'll still be fine. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you again man anything uh as we had anything you'd like to shout out before we go down out of here yeah uh you can check out the show uh, our live show is on twitch.tv slash spawn on me every wednesday night at 6 p.m pst uh we'll be having a fun uh couple of uh, conversations before the end of black history month this year uh, so make sure you're checking that stuff out um our show award show uh showcasing and spotlighting underrepresented people of color uh in the industry the spawnies is now on our youtube channel so please go check that out youtube.com slash spawn on me and yeah you can follow me on twitter at khalif adams and at spawn on me come say hello say what's up and, uh, and i'll say hey back <laughs> well thank you again again that was khalif adams from spawn on me that was open conversations thank you to all of the patrons who support us here at season gaming and everything we do until next time